And 10, purple guy. We know that William Afton is the infamous purple guy who was introduced in FNAF 2 and has subsequently appeared in almost every FNAF game, with the exception of 4 and 5. We know that William is the one we know as purple guy thanks to originally Matt Pat and Game Theory, who suggested that the name William Afton that had appeared in the Silver Eyes novel would be the name of the game killer since he was the killer in the novels. Lo and behold, come the opening cutscene for Sister Location, we hear William Afton being questioned about his design choices with the baby animatronic. And with a single line we get name confirmation. Those weren't the design choices we were curious about Mr. Afton. Instantly confirming Map had to be correct and BOOM you looking for this? We all got the name of the man we would one day love and hate at the same time. But mostly hate, at least in my case. And a 9 spray trap. And since we know that William is the purple guy, well, the purple guy that's meant to represent a shadow, we know that William is the character known as Springtrap. We learn this in one of the final Between Night minigames of FNAF 3, where we see William, after disassembling the animatronics, confronted by the souls of his child victims. However, they're, for some reason, freaking him out. I mean, like, it's understandable because, like, they're child ghosts and those are always freaky, but, like, you've already killed them once. <laughs> just, just do it again. And in an attempt to feel more confident or maybe to scare them away, he hops back into the golden springlock bonnie suit which he used to lure the children away originally. But thanks to a leaky ceiling, the mechanisms holding the robot parts back, known as the springlocks, fail and William gets shoved full of thousands of tiny little metal bits and robot bits. This is what we came to know as the spring locking. 30 years later, William is somehow still alive and uses the suit to hunt us down during the events of FNAF 3's main game. And at 8, CEO. We also know for a fact, thanks to the aforementioned Silver Eyes novel and the unreleased FNAF AR Faz facts, that William Afton was indeed the CEO of Fazbear Entertainment. He also had a partner named Henry in the books, whose first official appearance in the games was in FNAF 6. Henry's the one who delivered the final speech in that game, and this was proven thanks to the insanity ending, which ends up playing a voice recording that's labeled HRY and then a couple numbers, but HRY meaning Henry. However, as the CEO of Fazbear Entertainment, or at least the co-owner, William had uninhibited access to the entire network of Fazbear locations, which is what made it so easy for him to lure kids away and to know where the best places to kill them would be. I mean, I hate to be blunt by saying that, but like saying something like knowing the best places to go and do the deed or a similar phrase is probably more likely to get us flagged at this point. But yeah, William Afton is the CEO of Fast Fair Entertainment. And at seven, their appearance. The puppet has a very simple design, okay? Dark black fabric covering the body or like covering the endoskeleton, I guess. It has an endoskeleton. That, I don't want to see the puppet's endoskeleton. That just seems weird. The only deviation from that is a couple of white stripes near the wrists and then the mask. See, even dead kids possessing puppet animatronics will wear masks, people. The mask is simple yet a freaky design. It has solid black empty eyes and a purple, like purple streaks running down like the, the, the side of those like voids. It's like, I don't know what that is. Like, it's supposed to be tears, but it's not the crying child. It's like, what the hell? Plus, it has red cheeks and then some, like, it's like some damn demonic Pikachu level crap, okay? And then it has a mouth that makes me not want to know what that mouth do. Because it's probably gonna eat my face, okay? This is one, this is a creepy animatronic, especially when it's presented in the right way. Like when it's walking down the hall in FNAF VR. But other than that, if it's just chilling in the music box, it's relatively fine, even if it's poking its head out. Like, but I, why is it that people like use nursery rhymes to make things scary? Okay, like Pop Goes the Weasel, for example. That wasn't scary. That wasn't intended to be scary. Why do people use it when it, like, in a creepy situation? It's not, it's not okay, all right? Children are already scary enough. I almost got stabbed by one when I was working in an elementary school, okay? Well, I mean working, I was doing co-op, but then like some kid came at me with scissors, okay? It, I thought it was a joke, but no, no, that was, the, the teacher wasn't around, that little, he just came at me. But luckily, there were safety scissors, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I would've put that kid on the ground, okay? Even, I really wanted to, I just went, <gasps> boom, you know? <laughs> Uppercut him instead of flying across the portable, boom! <laughs> Call me William App. just, I would have done it. And six, family. Afton's family is messy business. With all of his kin meeting some kind of grisly fate, Afton is the first since he gets springlocked 30 years before the events of FNAF 3. But that's game release date wise first, since in the case of the actual timeline, first up is Elizabeth Afton, who, despite her father's warnings, gets a little too close to her favorite animatronic, which ends up being Baby. However, this causes Baby's killer instinct to activate, resulting in Elizabeth getting grabbed by a giant claw, scoop and then 
crushed inside the animatronic, who then she goes on to possess. However, at some point earlier, Afton's wife or baby mama or significant someone ended up dying or going missing or just leaving him. We don't really quite know what. But we can be sure that it isn't pretty since there seems to be no references to her in any of the game. Crying Child ends up getting killed after his head gets crushed by Fredbear in 1983 and he dies in the hospital. Then William himself gets spring locked and then burned multiple times. And then Michael gets his innards replaced with innards and turns physically purple and burns to death in the FNAF 6 fire. There's a lot of fire in these games and the little arsonist in me loves that. The cops are going to use these videos against me if I'm ever accused of literally anything and I know it. Halfway through into number 5, first, while we thought that Charlotte may not have been the first victim of William Afton, she was still, at least at that point in our minds, the first to possess any animatronic. This was shown to us in the Security Puppet minigame where we see the puppet and Charlie combine after she was brutally killed by Afton outside the Fazbear joint. And with what we knew about Remnant and Agony, um, how the true possession only comes from intense pain and emotion in the form of Agony, we can be damn well sure that she was in agonizing pain when she was killed. Not only was she like, you know, stabbed at the hands of her father's friend and business partner, but she was also stuck outside of her favorite place on Earth, somewhere that was literally designed to defend her. But the security puppet was blocked off by an unknown source, okay? Maybe it was just a couple of bullies who wanted a girl out of their fun. Maybe it was Afton setting it up. Who knows? Either way, she was in agony. So much so that when she died, she was instantly able to possess an animatronic that was designed to defend her. So much that it sacrificed its life crawling inside the rain, and it's like Henry coded himself into the, the puppet, but that's a theory for another day. Especially when Glitchtrap is sentient code. Maybe Henry is sentient code in like the puppet, kind of. In it for parallels. Now I talked about how William's family suffered as much as they could, perhaps as a way to torture William just as much as his DNA. However, he seems to have quite a few similarities with all of his kids, especially in how his story unfolds. The first and most obvious one is that in The Man in Room 1280, the third story of the fifth Fazbear Frights book Bunny Call, we see William in a coma after the FNAF 6 fire that was supposed to have killed him. This directly parallels to how Crying Child was in a coma post bite in FNAF 4. We know that he was in the hospital thanks to the IV, flower, and pill easter eggs, and the heart monitor that stops at the end of the game. However, William also shares moments with his other kids. Elizabeth ends up getting trapped inside Baby and possesses her. William ends up getting trapped inside Spring Bonnie. And while he doesn't possess it, he does control it just by moving. Since, like how Michael is filled with Ennard and his robotic body, William was filled with the robotic bits of that Spring Lock suit. And, I mean, they're both purple. One, one is figuratively purple, that being William, but still. Getting close to the end in number three, creation. The creation of the puppet is very straightforward. I've been kind of saying it this whole video. Charlotte was brutally killed outside of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, as seen in the FNAF 2 minigame of Take Cake, where Freddy is tasked with bringing cake to crying children, while we helplessly watch her get killed outside of the joint by none other than, you guessed it, Matthew Perry. Not really. But that's what takes us to the events of the security puppet minigame from FNAF 6, where we see that the puppet actually heads out back after this to find the body of Charlotte, and then it falls next to her, well, it, it falls first and then it crawls over to her, allowing her to live on by possessing it, which potentially then takes us to Midnight Motorist, which makes me think that Crying Child saw Charlotte being killed by his father since it, she was at the Fazbear restaurants and then the game was called later that night and he was already gone, but again, that's not certain. That's a that's a, that's a theory we've already talked about. I think. And ultimately, in a number two, had to have connections. William is a clever man, but for some reason, this guy still hides the bodies in the worst places. Sure, I don't think cops would initially check animatronics for dead bodies of missing children, but when reports started coming in about them leaking mucus and blood, I think that there would be an investigation. Plus, these animatronics are on display. They're out in front of a crowd on a regular, daily basis. One thing goes wrong and everyone ends up seeing your horrible deeds. So in my opinion, we know that William had to be paying someone off. Whether it be the police, the courts, the state, whoever it was, someone was getting paid to leave him alone. Because cops don't just get reports of robots bleeding where some kids went missing and they never found the bodies of those kids and then just not go investigate. Plus, even if William had cleaned out the animatronics, they would still ask why they were bleeding in the first place. And then take these robots in his evidence to inspect and probably have their own robotics expert look at it just to see if they could actually have the mechanisms to leak blood from their eyes, at least if that's an excuse William used. William is a smart man, but 
damn he's dumb. And dumb criminals are the ones who get caught. So the fact that he didn't get caught means he had to have some form of connection or payment plan worked out with someone. And finally, in at number one, he planned his spree. A lot of people wrongfully assume that William Afton turned to killing in an effort to bring back his children after he saw that his daughter possessed baby. However, thanks to the fast facts found in FNAF AR's game files and just logic, we know that this isn't the case. Quote from the fast facts, some of the first animatronics built by William Afton featured claw mechanisms that were able to hide away items inside them. The only animatronics we know that are able to do this are the fun time animatronics, and that's because of baby. And since these are some of the first animatronics built by Afton, we know that he always intended for kids to be able to be grabbed and stored inside these robots. Which begs the question, why? Why would Afton want to start killing in the first place? It could be because of whatever happened with or to his wife, but if someone kills out of anger, they usually want to do it themselves and not with robots who do it for them. And since Baby was built with this claw mechanism in mind, he didn't know about robots getting possessed before the desire to kill reared its ugly head because Baby was being designed with the claw that would later then cause Elizabeth to possess her. So what could be the initial trigger? We still don't know. But what we do know is that William Afton had killing in mind way before his kids entered the fray and before he found out about possession. In a 10 not first. Apparently, unlike everyone in the YouTube comments, the puppet was not indeed first. Well, the first victim of William Afton. At least, that's what we thought at the time. And while that idea did vanish before Security Breach came out, let me explain why we thought that the puppet wasn't the first victim. Because we thought it ended up being Chica, as because she told us so in Ultimate Custom Night, saying that she was the first and has seen everything, which is pretty weird when you think about it. Like, I don't know why we thought that Susie was gonna be the first one to die. It, it should have been Charlotte, and it was Charlotte, but that one line messed everything up. Like, why is it that every time we think we have something right about the series, and then, like, we have it locked in, and that, like, it's established within the community, Scott ends up, like, just throwing it down the drain, or making us think that he does. Like, it happened with the puppet in this instance, and it happened with the identity of Michael Afton multiple times. Like, every, every time we think we have something figured out, unless it's been directly confirmed by Scott in, like, a Reddit post, he throws it out the window. Well, like, on, on, on like, our first assumptions that the puppet was first, but then he threw it out the window and then he like he went out and then threw it back in. And at 9, give life. From the FNAF 2 minigame, give gifts, give life, we can tell that the puppet, while being the first, because they they were the first, okay? <laughs> the puppet was the first, but it was also the one who brought the other animatronics to life in the suits, or at least gave them the ability to move. We see that the children lay dead on the ground, and then the puppet goes to give them gifts to cheer them up, because they look sad, because, you know, they're dead. Um, but when that doesn't work, the puppet, for some reason, is like, oh, damn, they must be dead, oh, let's bring them back to life in the animatronics animatronic suits or something which is an interesting which it's pretty interesting from a lore standpoint um, since we what we know about remnant because like they were in the suits they had possessed the suits but I guess maybe the puppet activated their remnant something like that I mean there were, weren't really any remnant based animatronics after this uh, because the fun times aren't possessed um, and then the only one that gets possessed is Springtrap so hey I don't know I, it, it sounds weird <laughs> Maybe they didn't originally suffer enough and the puppet had to spark them, which sounds even worse. Oh man, like, well, the FNAF series will literally do anything at this point, uh, so I can never know. Um, but you know what? None of this is as fun as killing Braith and Skyrim. What a, what a deviation from the script. And it ain't behind the mask. Do you want to know who's behind the mask? Do you, like, really want to know? Because you already know, people. Come on, I literally said it earlier. It's, it's Charlotte. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, like I, I'm okay. I mentioned it. I mentioned the name of Charlotte, but it's you. You knew that already. It's not like this channel is introducing you to FNAF right now. You're all here because Matt Pat isn't uploading any new FNAF videos. Okay. <laughs> Either way, the one hidden behind the puppet mask is Charlotte, Henry's daughter, as revealed in the original FNAF novel trilogy. We technically don't know her official name in the games since her grave was blurred out in the gravestone ending of FNAF 6. But nevertheless, um. 
It's still Henry's daughter, as told to us by Henry himself during the final monologue of the real FNAF 6 ending. We know that this is Henry speaking, not only because he calls the puppet his daughter, but also because in the insanity ending we hear an audio file play, and on the monitor, the actual computer file is labeled as HRY223, and HRY in this instance would mean Henry. So yes, Charlotte, or Charlie, is the puppet. It's Evan, main antagonist. William Afton, even if he is but a single man, or I guess a single dad, more on that in a minute, He's still the driving force behind this entire series, and the main antagonist of every single game. <laughs> to this day, actually. Sure, we may have to fend off some animatronics for six hours, but that doesn't mean that they're the overarching antagonist to the series. None of this would be happening if it wasn't for William. It's like a DD and d campaign, with William Afton being the big bad evil guy, or BBEG, while the various games and the animatronics are the individual adventures and the minions that you fight. Yes, they're also antagonists, but the big bad evil guy is the reason they're there, therefore he is the main antagonist. William, in this case, is the BBEG. Since all the animatronics got possessed because he killed the kids who possessed the suits. Including his own daughter. Speaking of which. And it's six key player. When we talk about FNAF, you usually think about the core four animatronic. The ones that have had multiple versions of themselves made and appear to be in basically every game. Aside from Chica and Sister Location. I guess. And, and Bonnie and... and security breach. I don't know, I guess uh, Scott might have been a little too worried about the fan art, especially based on Bonnie x Chica, which is a whole other can of worms, and you know what? Y'all y'all need to be sorted out for that. That's that, that that's weird. However, even though she got introduced in the second game, the puppet has been present in at least six out of the eight FNAF games. Appearing in FNAF 2, FNAF 3, FNAF 4 as Nightmare Yon, FNAF 6 in the Security Puppet Minigame, Ultimate Custom Night, FNAF VR, Help Wanted, and FNAF 1 in the form of the poster that can sometimes appear on the wall. And they've actually kind of been in FNAF Security Breach if you count the uh like the discontinued staff bots, like the broken ones that have like the in your dreams written on them, like the Vanny bots, the Vanny versions of the bots. Yeah, she was also in Security Breach, so yeah, the, the puppet has been the, the pretty core character, if I do say so myself. At least, the, I, you know what I do. S Screw it, I say it myself. Halfway through into number five, first victim. Now the topic of who ends up really being the first victim is still debated to this day. However, there are currently two possibilities, so I will cover both options. The first, ironically, and the original first victim was the puppet, Charlotte, Henry's daughter. Keep in mind that Henry was William's business partner and co-owner of Fazbear Entertainment, most likely until his daughter died. We thought the puppet was first since, well, they seemingly gave life to the other animatronics, or at least showed them how to control themselves, given that they're just intense human emotion. And the daughter of your business partner seems like a more important kill than some random kid with blonde hair. Speaking of which, the other potential first victim is Chica, Susie, who wasn't in the running until one of Withered Chica's voice lines from Ultimate Custom Night that says, I was the first. I have seen everything. Which could mean that she was the first victim overall, but it could also simply mean that she was the first of the missing children's incident from 1985 when the original five animatronic victims were killed. So currently, the general consensus is that Charlotte was the first overall victim and possesses the puppet like we see in the security puppet minigame, and then Susie was the next direct victim in 1985 at what would be the start of the missing children's incident. And at 4, Lefty. The Lefty animatronic is actually an acronym, L-E-F-T-E. -E. It stands for Lure, Encapsulate, Fuse, Transport, and Extract. So before you go off into the comments saying that the number is spelt wrong, it's not, okay? We spelt it exactly right. It's just more commonly written with a Y. This version of Freddy, which technically it is because it's a bear, don't come at me, okay? <laughs> Any bear with Freddy characteristics is a version of Freddy in my eyes. Anyway, this bear was specifically designed by Henry to emit the bracelet code that corresponds with the one that Charlotte was wearing, as we see in the Security Puppet minigame, the green one. Then we use that bracelet to lure the puppet, which has Charlotte inside, towards us to capture her. Then we bring her to the pizzeria from Pizzeria Simulator, so then we can free her soul. This line is such a good example of context and delivery. Like, the way that, like, I kind of put that is nice. Like, he wants to free her soul. But if I was, like, to say something like, capture her, and then bring her to the pizzeria so that she could burn with the rest, which is still true, that sounds a lot more sinister. So it just goes to show you that maybe you need a little bit more perspective on everything you, you read, or hear, or do, or experience. You're welcome. Getting close to the end, in at number three, Possessed. In the same novel, 
novel where we learn about what happened to William after the fire, we also learn the reason this man always comes back. It's because he was possessed. The one you should not have killed from Ultimate Custom Night is not just an angry victim, but rather the spirit that's been keeping William alive this whole time in order to watch him suffer. In the book, this kid's name is Andrew, but this possession explains how William is able to survive fire after fire, being locked in a windowless and foodless room for 30 years and being shoved full of millions of robotic parts, and how literally anything that happens cannot cause him to actually die with any form of permanence. Of course, now he's sentient code, which is probably one of the scariest things imaginable. So FNAF is about to become a sci-fi series as we try to erase every instance of him as if he was Zoloft from the MCU. I mean, like, normal sentient robots are terrifying, especially sentient AI, but sentient AI that's literally the consciousness of a serial killer targeting kids is absolutely horrific and unwarranted. But ultimately, in a number two, fan versions. While the normal puppet animatronic may not be scary per se, the fan-made versions of the character are damn freaky. Take the character of the Reaper puppet, for example, from Final Nights 3 and 4. The scrapped withered puppet that was showcased by Amanda in the top 10 scary FNAF fan animatronics part 2 from ages ago, or literally any other animatronic puppet that has ever been created, okay? I don't know how people are so easily able to make this damn thing so freaking terrifying. I usually don't include fan-made versions as a number on fact lists, but, you know, for some reason, so many people want to make terrifying versions of the puppet. Like, what about the Havoc puppet from Dermidibus? Have you seen that thing? It's like the spiders in Australia got their hands on the illicit substances that bodybuilders use. If you're mad about, like, weird phrasing, blame YouTube, not me. Okay, this puppet has got me unable to speak. And finally, in a number one, Family Ties. The puppet is one of the few dead kids to have a connection to someone important in the series, the others being members of the Afton family. The puppet, on the other hand, is a member of the Emily family. Well, at least according to the book, their last name is Emily, but who cares at this point? Out of everything we want answered, you decide to give us Henry's last name? Like, we legit have a whole few lists about the top 10 FNAF unanswered questions, mysteries, things we want to know, but yeah. Tell us this. Tell us their last name. Also, you should go check out those videos, by the way. However, Charlotte has more of a connection to anyone than anyone else in the series. I mean, she is Henry's daughter, the mastermind behind the animatronics of the Freddy restaurants, and then she was killed by William Afton, the business partner to her father. She was also probably friends with the kids that go on to be the missing children since their parents were together so much. She was also probably friends with Afton's kids since their parents were together so much and you know what, just because it's Scott, she was probably friends with the five missing children from 1985. So yeah, and then she also brings life to them, so yeah, you know what, I count it, that's all, that's it.